Recording from Far Spoken Studios in beautiful Marietta, Georgia, you are listening to the Think Inclusive Podcast, Episode 12, brought to you by Brooks Publishing Company. I'm your host, Tim Viegas. It has been a few months since we have published a podcast interview here at Think Inclusive, and there is a good reason. Since we have been expanding the website, we have been upgrading our sound equipment and computer hardware. In addition, we are changing the format slightly so that hopefully we can produce more podcasts for you to listen to. Today, you will hear two edited interviews that I did from almost a year ago. First, with Audrey Gomez and Asia McKee, educators that have had experience in the classroom as well as in teacher training. They give a unique perspective on how we can prepare teachers who are about to enter into the field of special education and also highlight what a degree in disability studies looks like. My second interview is with a middle school teacher who works here in the Atlanta metro area. Her book, Sped, is about a fictional character, Jack Parker, as he navigates the complexities of having learning disabilities in the eighth grade in being in special education. At the time of this interview, Sped 2, which is Ree's second book, had not come out yet, but is now on Amazon Kindle and in paperback. I'll have the links in the show notes page. I'll also tell you how you can hear the complete unedited versions of the interviews at the end of the podcast. So without further ado, let's get to the Think Inclusive podcast. Thanks for listening. Today on the Think Inclusive podcast, um, I have Audrey Gomez. Uh, and Asia McKee. Uh, Audrey Gomez has been in the field of special education since 2000. Uh, She has worked uh, as a resource specialist and in self-contained classrooms uh, in the K-12 setting for the Newport Mesa Unified School District and she is currently an adjunct uh, professor for the Department of Special Ed at Chapman University. Uh, Asia McKee has worked in early childhood uh, in the early childhood field since 1996 Uh, She teaches early childhood special education for Capistrano Unified School District, and she is a certified special education advocate. She also works part-time as an adjunct professor with Cal State University Fullerton uh, in the special education department. Um, Thank you both for being here, Audrey and Asia. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, Well, I'm excited uh, to talk to both of you because I'm uh, I'm California I'm a California guy. <laughs> I've been, uh, <laughs> and uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Newport Mesa and Capistrano um, are both in uh, Orange County, California, um, and that's also um, kind of where my my old stomping grounds are. So, um, I used to work in Pasadena Unified, uh, so I'm pretty familiar with how California uh, runs their schools as far as uh, special education. So I wanted to have you on because I know that you are a part of uh, the Disability Studies program at um, at Chapman University. Um, so before we kind of get into talking about disability studies and disability rights, um, either Audrey or Asia, could you, uh, one of you, tell us a little bit about the Disability Studies program at Chapman? Sure, uh, we can do that. This is Asia. So the Disability Studies program, it emphasizes um, and explores disability as a social construct, and it kind of investigates new ways to think about education and support people who learn differently. Since it is a fairly kind of a a new thing, um, especially on the West Coast, um, some of our, some of the the people listening may not even really know necessarily what Disability Studies is. Um, like what exactly it, it is or what is taught, the coursework. Um, is there a certain way to think about disability studies as far as um, why, why it's really important? Why, why do you need disability studies? All right. Um, this is Audrey. So uh, disability studies really challenges the way in which this disability is um, constructed in society. It looks at disability from a different standpoint. Um, It's not so focused on um, the impairment. So if we look at what disability studies is not, um, it's not what we would consider as the medical model of disability um, and where we are focused on um, 
curing or fixing a child because of their disability. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's more of a progressive approach on um, how to look at disability, right? And and I, I've kind of described it before um, as I think especially – because it's fairly new and because it, it kind of intertwines in some ways in special education, a lot of people hear disability studies and they think that we're learning about different types of disabilities, right? Right. We're going to learn all about Down syndrome. We're going to learn all about autism, different things like that, when really it's looking at the broad picture of disability itself. So not specific disabilities, but disability itself in general. And I kind of explain it to people as, you know, we're looking broadly at disability as a social construct, which we can get into in more detail. And then within that view of disability, then you're looking at different things like the special education system and services. So it's more viewing disability, like I said, as a social construct, right? So how we view disability as a difference. And looking at things like, are we disabling individuals by not providing them with the support or the environmental changes that they need to be um, accessing whatever they want to access in life? And typically, um, disability, um, we focus on the diagnosis of a person Mm -hmm. um, and the disability label, whereas disability studies, um, we're more focused on the strengths and the needs of the individual as defined by them. It it seems um it seems like this is in conjunction or it, it kind of parallels um the the like a the self advocacy movement. Um, am, am mm-hmm. I am I thinking about that correctly? Like uh, um, and I'm not sure exactly what you know when that necessarily started. You you might have more information about that that, that than I do, but. Um, this kind of change in thinking about disability instead of, um, you know, the, you know, the person who has, you know, cerebral palsy or autism or however you want to, whatever disability diagnosis mm-hmm. that you have, um, uh, this change in thinking of that, you know, if only we were able to cure this, um, then they could leave right. a quote unquote normal life. Like, like how, how did we start changing from that view to, to what, what disability studies is trying to promote? Well, I think it really, um, uh, this is Audrey, came from when we look at uh, Brown versus Board of Education and how that was such, that was a seminal court case for civil rights movement. And that, um, not only change the way um, people of color were treated within society, within schools, um, but that was um, eye-opening for um, people with disabilities and wanting the same um, equal rights. And I think um, that's when uh, the Rehabilitation Act was enacted in 73. Um, That really uh, brought an awareness to... um, uh, to the idea of um, people with disabilities not being discriminated against um, within um, the public sector. And I feel like um, it was a lot of, um, from the Rehabilitation Act and lots of protests, lots of advocates such as Ed Roberts, um, Mm -hmm. who really wanted um, equal rights and who wanted to be part of the community, we wanted to be part of the educational system and have the same rights as peers without disabilities. So they saw this seminal court case, um, such as Brown versus Board of Education, and and where these people started to obtain these rights, and um, through advocacy, and um, a lot of people with disabilities wanted those same uh, rights. Is there um, is there a particular court case that I guess defines the disability rights movement other than Bra- uh, Brown versus Board of Education, um, or is that well, kind of the thing? Yeah, there's not really a seminal court case that um, for the disability rights movement, uh, but the Rehabilitation Act of 504 really sets the tone. Um, because it allowed, um, uh, on the basis 
it, it was legislation that guaranteed that um, people with disabilities were provided civil rights. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of, but there, other than that, and then um, a lot of other legislation stemmed off from that. So that was the precursor to like ADA, the um, mm-hmm. American Disabilities Act. And then from then, we've, um, through a lot of um, protests and strong advocacy, um, a lot of other discrimination specific laws came into place. Um, so the disability rights movement was really um, right after Brown versus Board of Education, which was 54, and then the disability rights movement went um, started around in the 60s. Um, and then after that, there were several court cases demanding um, equality, such as the Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Citizens, Park versus Commonwealth, mm-hmm. uh, and Mills versus Board of Education. And those were in the 70s. Um, and then we, and then we uh, you know, in 75, we had the um, enactment of Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which later, you know, was public law 94, uh, 142 or IDEA, which is, which is what it is now. Right. Um, so there was a lot of um, push among the disability community for equal rights. But there wasn't one court case. There was um, a culmination of, of things going on at that time where um, people with disabilities um, sought out uh, to obtain equal rights, which pushed a lot more legislation and um, uh, in, in, in order to prove um, and to respond to these people um, that they, uh, they were, um, they should have the yeah have the same access right right uh, and I, oh yeah, I, well, go ahead. I, was gonna, I was just as Asia I was just going to add to that that <clears throat> while this is kind of happening on the legislation side um, running parallel to that would be a group of special education scholars and researchers that started to examine special education practices critically I think hmm. and um meet together at different conferences and discuss uh, looking at their area of expertise critically and listening to the voices of individuals with disabilities and hearing the stories about um, the push for individuals with disabilities to maybe overcome their disability and strive for normalcy and listening to stories about hierarchy of disability. And I think that these scholars, they were looking very um, analytical and critically at their their field of special ed and finding that there were some parts of special education that did maybe promote these ideas of thinking, right? So we assess students and we decide that they don't fall within the normal you know, the normal range, they fall outside the bell curve, and does this alone promote, you know, individuals wanting to strive for things like normalcy? Right. So I think as they began to to look at the field, they kind of morphed into this, the, they started to morph their ideas and their thoughts and their practices um, in combination with the legislation and the movements going on, and this disability study field emerged from that. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the professors that we have here at Chapman, and I believe a lot of the professors across the United States that are disability studies professors were originally special education teachers and then special education professors. And now they've moved into the field of disability studies. So where do you think the, I guess, field of special education is going and do you think that, um, I, I believe that IDA is going to be reauthorized soon? Am I, am, is that correct? Or no? Am I not thinking I, about I, that right? Well, we've heard that, but I don't have any details on that. I, I wouldn't know to answer more about how or when that would be. Okay. But it, I mean, it is going to, it is, it will be, um, you know, probably in the next mm-hmm. five five years I, I would imagine um eventually the, I, yeah i would imagine it would be um so it i guess where do you see where do you see special education going um and um because we have a lot of things going on in 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 education right now we have got we've got common core 
you know mm -hmm. uh, we also have um, the redesign of our state testing um, and then we also and that also includes the redesign of alternate assessment um, it also includes um, this pairing or push for uh, universal design for learning right uh, and and so i'm curious as to what you you two think about the future of special education and if there is going to be in in you know in your opinion um going to need uh if there will need to be more legislation um in the future um so, uh, you know, everyone's talking about inclusion right now mm -hmm. and what, what it means to be included uh, for students with disabilities. And, and, and because it's not, um, everyone has their own definition of what inclusion means. Right. And um, since inclusion is not written in the law, um, you know, everyone believes it to be something a little bit different. And I think that's when we look at the law and, and we look at whether we're providing appropriate services, um, some of the language within the law can be unclear. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes um, the push or the movement towards inclusive practices um, uh, is affected. And um, but I really feel that if we are going to if we're going to go through um, with providing uh, students with disabilities um, to be educated in their neighborhood schools alongside their peers without disabilities. We do need to look at uh, making our um, current laws more clear. Mm -hmm. and, and we also need to make sure that we are properly training um, our general education teachers yeah. so that they are able to provide the supports and services for students with an array of disabilities within their classrooms. Um, I think we need to train our teachers in universal design for learning and um, and having them understand that a uni one a basic universal curriculum may not be appropriate for all of their students in the classroom. And so they need to use different methods or measures in order to be able to make sure that their students have access to the curriculum, that it's appropriate, and that they're successful in these classrooms. So I feel like we um, are moving in the right direction um, towards inclusive practices. However, we still have um, a lot of steps that we need to take to ensure that um, students with disabilities are um, in classrooms and are learning and are members of the classroom community are appreciated value uh, and valued members in the classrooms and um, that they are able to be successful in the classrooms. Yeah, I was just going to add, this is Asia, mm -hmm. I was just going to add that as we look at the state of special education, I think it's important to look at different state requirements for credentialing programs. I mean, I think that special educators would be the natural choice for um, for helping students move forward, advocating, of course, for their students, um, pushing for civil rights for individuals with disability studies. Special educators, you know, you were trained at Cal State Fullerton. We were both trained at Cal State Fullerton. And um, inclusion is a big part of their program, and uh -huh. they teach their teachers, they teach their special educators how to do that, I think there's been the big disconnect, as always, between universities and colleges and then districts. And I think, you know, sometimes theory and a sense is easier than the practical application of things. Right. And I know that the districts here in Orange County are starting to move to a more inclusive schooling model. So um, <clears throat> we're starting to see some change, which is really exciting. But I do think, like Audrey pointed out, a big key is to train the general educators on how to work with the students that are in their class. You know, they have received training for, you know, in a different model than their training educators now. Right. And they may have had one class that talks about special education or one, one class that talks about individuals with disabilities. 
um, but they might lack the skills or the education and the knowledge to know how to move forward. And then even though a lot of the university programs do train special educators to co-teach and collaborate together, I, I still think that um, there's still an area that needs to be connected together. There's still a little bit of disconnect, and, and I think that state requirements for credentialing programs also need to alter the way that they uh, put together the requirements for the programs. I think asking different things of the educators I'm looking more at inclusive practices from the very beginning and looking at individuals with disabilities um, from maybe a DSE or a disability studies and education point of view might help. That it might lend to that um, that need or desire that's out there. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that it's a slow process, but it's it's getting there. So, and I think with uh, like for example with Common Core and redesigning state testing. Um, it, it's, it's imperative that uh, students with special needs um, are thought of during the implementation of these curriculums and assessments and, um, and not just as an afterthought. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, when we are starting to implement these common core units, um, again, it just comes off as a universal curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that we are embedding um, universal design for learning methods and strategies, and we're providing these general education teachers with as much support and services so within, these, within Common Core so that students can be successful. The same thing with redesigning state testing and now it being um, a computer-based assessment as opposed to um, uh, paper and pe pencil assessment, we need to ensure that our students with disabilities, that this is an appropriate assessment for them. And um, so I feel like sometimes uh, special education or and students with special needs is sometimes an afterthought with the implementation of these um, new measures and curriculums. And so when we're looking at how um, the next step um, with being common core and, and these, these new designs, um, for state testing, we really need to be cognizant that we are um, that it's uh, accessible for a variety of learners, even students without disabilities. For example, like English language learners, um, are they going to be successful, and are we providing them with the same with, the, with enough supports and services that they can be successful um, with these new measures and, measures and curriculum? And I and just kind of touching on that, this is Asia, but. Mm -hmm. um, Looking at Common Core and Universal Design for Learning, um, there's some great work out there by Joseph Casbaro, I think is how you pronounce the last name, and he put out some information that looks at CCSS and UDL and how to um, work towards those Common Core standards using UDL. And I think that a lot of the things that we implement, you know, Every couple of years, I think the pendulum swings in another direction for education in general. Mm -hmm. So I think just looking at how we approach these things that roll out is really going to be a key. And as Audrey was saying, you know, even if you look at the Common Core website, um, there's a different page that you can go to that talks about students with disabilities and how to implement the Common Core with them, which to me, doesn't look like they were in the forefront of the mind, the forefront of the mind of the individuals that developed the Common Core. It kind of sends the message being on a separate page, not being part of the original framework of the Common Core, mm -hmm. that maybe some of the students with disabilities were an afterthought. Right. So I think just that message alone, what does it say about disability in general? Mm. So I think mm -hmm. just kind of examining it from another lens and, and going about what we need to implement and we need to do um, with different techniques and different strategies. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast to learn how you can hear the complete and unedited version of my interview with Audrey in Asia. And now my interview with educator Re Marzullo, author of SPED and SPED 2. On the phone with me, I have Re Marzullo. Uh, she is the author of two books, uh, SPED and SPED 2. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Ree. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. I really appreciate it. 
No problem. I have your book sped and it's fascinating and I want to, to share it with um, the Think Inclusive readers and listeners and, and I wanted to have you on and talk to you uh, a little bit about it because a lot of uh, a lot of teachers and a lot of parents uh, visit the site and sometimes special education is a very mysterious thing we don't know you know what it is and uh, what happens and um, I think your book your books share a a good insight uh, from the perspective uh, of a student so why don't you give us a little bit of a synopsis of the book that you wrote, SPED? Well, the first book, SPED, is about Jack Parker, and he's an eighth grader. He has dyslexia, and he got through most of elementary school, kind of faking his way through, um, but it hit him in fourth or fifth grade. I need some help. So he got into the special ed program, and when he went to middle school, he was put in a small group class. And for sixth and seventh grade, that was fine. He, he dealt with it. But when he got to eighth grade and he discovered girls, he's like, yo, where are the ladies? <laughs> There's no <laughs> girls in this class. I want out. <laughs> and so Sped is really the story of how he tries to get his parents on board and get the administration on board that he wants to be in the general ed population, not just him, but his special ed uh, small group classmates as well. So it's, it's his journey trying to get through that. Now, what was the inspiration for the book? What you know? Why did you delve into this topic? Um, honestly, I I'm, I'm a middle school teacher, and I was trying to find a book for our book club. And Time Magazine had a great recommendation, middle school novel. I read it, and I thought, oh my goodness, I can I can write a book. You know what? I've always been I was an English major, a journalism major. I've always loved to write. And once the idea of writing a book came to me. Jack Parker was at my door two minutes later. Like, he showed up, his just little self, his voice, his mannerisms, everything. Um, I've never taught Jack per se, but in 20 years, I've taught a lot of mini Jacks. I've taught, I've just taught a lot of kids, and all that just came out. And when I sit down to write, I hear... I hear his voice, I hear his classmates' voices, I hear the bully's voice, I hear the teacher's voice, and so um, it's really been a great experience for me. It's been a lot of fun. Now, um, are are you involved with special ed teaching at all, or are you are just just a general ed teacher? Or how? no, I I team teach. I have gosh for most of my career. I'll have a couple team taught classes. I've got honors classes. I have on level classes. Um, I really see the range of students. In my day. Um, now, how has your view of special education changed um, in, in light of uh, the, the the books? Well, I think the first thing that writing these books has done it, it helped me get rid of those labels that I had a tendency to put on kids. Um, when I saw the acronym, you know, A D H D E B D, whatever the initials were, by that special ed student site. Uh, by their IEP or whatever, um, writing this book to help me see through their eyes that, you know, what we're all just people, we're all just kids. And one of the two really great things about the response to this book were my general ed kids who wrote book reviews, book reports about how much they appreciated um, seeing the special ed student's perspective, that they never really thought about it, mm. you know, that it must be tough. Running is tough when you're a general ed kid, so make it even more tough when you're when you're special ed and you have difficulties. And then I think one of my favorite things is when a special ed student, kids maybe I don't even teach, come up and say thanks. You know, this is a character I could relate to, and that is hard for me to find in a book. And and they're just appreciative. So for me, it's it's helped me see kids as kids again, without trying to put a label on them. And that's been really great. Oh, that's that's great. That's wonderful. Um, now, how is Sped Two different than uh, than the first book? Well, I cannot give away important plot no, details. No, of course not. <laughs> um, but it's different. It's different. It's a sequel. Okay. And I've actually um, just gotten like the first five thousand words of Summer Sped, so it's oh. actually going to be a trilogy. Jack Parker will continue. 
Um, and like I said, I have so much fun writing these, and I get a lot of gratification out of it, out of seeing kids laugh. They're funny. They're humorous books. Um, I don't want to say there's lessons because that sounds very teacherish. Um, <laughs> but adults, adults, I will say adults have enjoyed them a great deal as well as kids. Kids eat them up. So there's a little something for everybody, I think. Great. Um, why don't you tell us uh, how you can how we can get um, the books? Well, if you have a Kindle, you can absolutely get it on Amazon, or you can order the paperback on Amazon. And if you are an iPad person, iBooks carry them as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time, Marie. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, if you're listening, oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, please go ahead and check out um, SPED and SPED2, and we'll all be waiting for summer SPED. Yeah, <laughs> we got a minute to wait on that one, but I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for, for having me, Tim. I really appreciate your question. That concludes this edition of the Think Inclusive podcast. For more information about Audrey in Asia and what disability studies really mean, you can visit ChapmanDisabilityStudies.com. For more information on Re Marzullo's books, you can visit her website, ReMarzullo.wordpress.com, as well as download SPED and SPED2 from Amazon. Remember, you can always find us on Twitter at think underscore inclusive or on the web at thinkinclusive.us. Visit our sponsor at brookspublishing.com and receive 25% off your order using the promo code TIMBD25. If you're interested in hearing unedited versions of the interview, Become a Think Inclusive Plus member today and download them from our members' content area. Other benefits of membership include an online curated newsletter that includes inclusion-related links from around the web, access to the Think Inclusive archive, book excerpts, and exclusive articles, and coming later this year, video modules and other resources from our sponsor and partner, Kids Included Together specializing in providing best practices training to community-based organizations who are committed to including children with and without disabilities. Use the promo code PODCAST to receive $10 off a yearly membership to Think Inclusive. Today's show was produced by Far Spoken Recordings, talking into condenser microphones, a Xenix mixer, a MacBook Pro, Garage Band, and a Skype account. Exit music by SS41 with their song Heart of It. You can download it from iTunes or stream it on Spotify. You can also subscribe to the Think Inclusive podcast via the iTunes Music Store or Podomatic.com, the largest community of independent podcasters on the planet. From Marietta, Georgia, please join us again on the Think Inclusive podcast. Thanks for your time and attention.